On Monday, March 25th, 2024, at 11.01 a.m., Attorney David Hennessy filed a post-hearing memorandum regarding the contempt hearing that was had at Allen Superior Court on March 18th, 2024. As previously argued by the defense, the entire process for pursuing indirect contempt was defective. Should the court reconsider that argument, the defense would offer some additional authority. Acts of an indirect contempt, on the other hand, are those which undermine the activities of the court that fail to satisfy one of the direct contempt requirements. He quotes some special codes. Indirect contempt proceedings require appointment of a special judge, an array of due process protections, including notice and an opportunity to be heard. And he cites various codes, Williams v. State. State's exhibit number one was the press release from the defense that the prosecution alleged constituted indirect contempt. Mr. Rosie testified as to three legitimate purposes of the release. Number one, put an end to the incessant and inordinate requests from the media. Number two, respond to the torrent of detailed information disseminated by state actors and family members. See Defense Exhibit T, which identified over 130 press conferences, press releases, or media disseminations. And number three, generate tips to assist with the defense of Mr. Allen, of which there were many that were very useful. It bears repeating that the press release did not violate any existing court order. Mr. McClellan represented to the court that the gag order was issued December 1st, 2022. The court accepted his representation when taking judicial notice until the defense challenged it. Both then conceded it was issued December 2nd, 2022. It is understandable that Mr. McClellan and Judge Gull may have taken umbrage at the press release due to prior unrecorded conversations in chambers. However, the contempt power does not lie to soothe the wounded sensibilities of a judge. Grimm versus State Accord Mockby versus State. To the extent the court believes there was a violation of a rule of professional conduct, trial courts do not have jurisdiction to review such, as noted in the first memorandum on contempt filed by the defense. State's exhibit number two was the attachment to the accidentally misdirected email to Brandon Woodhouse. It was a thumb drive map. Mr. McClellan complained that it contained names. It did contain names, but that was necessary to be able to identify what was where on the thumb drive. It was nothing more than a discovery organizational outline. There was nothing in that outline that identified any substance of interviews or conversations with the persons named or any other substance at all. Compared to the leaks of two entire probable cause affidavits, which contained details of the investigation, the disclosure of the discovery of a bullet and gun, and others, the thumb drive map was insignificant. Mr. McClellan argues that was a violation of the protective order. First, it was not disseminated. The definition of disseminate is to spread widely. That email was sent to one single person who is an unintended recipient. The evidence showed that Mr. Baldwin contacted Woodhouse within an hour to have him delete it. Second, Mr. Rosie testified concerning an in-chambers conversation where the protective order was intended to prohibit public disclosure through media outlets. His testimony was not contradicted. State's Exhibit Number 3 was a discovery receipt that was not admitted. State's Exhibit Number 4 was the email string between Messrs. McClelland, Baldwin, Rosie, and Judge Gall concerning the leaks and ensuing investigation. Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Ro Rosie com cooperated fully and without delay. They were open, honest, and complete in their communications to investigators and the court. State's Exhibit Number 5 consisted of five pictures which the state alleged were disseminated by Fortson after receiving them from Westerman. Sergeant Holman testified that he believed he had seen them at a deposition. Mr. Rosie testified that he reviewed the deposition exhibits and compared them to the five photographs rather than rely on memory alone. He then testified without contradiction that two of the photos were not created or used by the defense. Thus, those two could not 
not have come from Westerman. To the extent they may have come from Fortson, he had many other sources as confirmed by State's Exhibit 6, which was 143 pages of Fortson's communications. The remaining three photographs were not offensive and would eventually be public. It was not dissemination of damaging information. The evidence disclosed many sources of the photographs that were never investigated. The most egregious leak was the detailed probable cause affidavit to search Logan's property. Sergeant Holman testified he asked Barbara where she got and she said from Logan however he also testified the search warrant affidavit is never left with the person just a copy of the search warrant thus Barbara's statement had to be false that affidavit also had quote murder sheet overlaid on every page sergeant holman never asked the murder sheet sheet people about it and never did any further investigation as to the source states exhibit six was 143 pages of fortson's communications the state had previously underside council 145 pages at no time did they disclose what pages were removed or why not once did Fortson identify Westerman as his source. Not once did he describe any direct contact with Andrew Baldwin, not in person, not by phone, or any messaging application. See Appendix 1, attached here too. The state argued that Fortson saying he was going to Franklin somehow connected Fortson to Baldwin because his office was in Franklin. That is an unsupported leap in logic. There was no evidence that Fortson actually went to Franklin, and there was no mention of Andrew Baldwin regarding his trip to Franklin. The state ignored Miss Westerman's ties to Franklin. Throughout the 143 pages admitted, there were only four references to, quote, Andy. The first was that they may have Messer's phone. She tried to give it to Holman, but he ghosted her, so she gave it to Andy. No source was identified for that information, and it was not attributed to Andy. The second was that Andy had audio of Professor Turco's statements. The third was that the judge was setting a suppression hearing, but Andy is seeking clarity. Those three references did not identify the source of the information and was not attributed to Andy. The last was that he's going to be with Andy tonight. There is no identification who he is or what they might have been meeting about. There was no evidence of any meeting. Again, he did not identify any source for his alleged information. State's exhibit number seven was Andrew Baldwin's email to Judge Gall copying all the other attorneys. He began by saying, we want the leaker caught. He related what he knew as of October 9th, 2023, regarding the photographs and other leaks. He ended with a suggestion that the FBI should investigate. If he had knowingly, intentionally, or willfully participated in any dissemination of any photographs, he would never have suggested the FBI investigate. State's Exhibit Number 8 is Mr. Rosie's letter to Judge Gull consisting of seven pages. He disclosed all that he knew about the leak and reported other more sensitive and damaging leaks for the court's consideration. State's Exhibit Number 9 is Mr. Westerman's affidavit which clearly establishes that what he did was not known by Mr. Baldwin and that Mr. Baldwin did not participate. He admitted that what he did was without any authorization whatsoever. State's Exhibit Number 10 consists of 20 pages of back and forth messages between Mr. Baldwin and an unidentified person. The state alleged that person was Mr. Westerman. That exhibit was admitted over objection because it contained Mr. Baldwin's mental impressions and work product and failed to identify the other participant. Mr. McClellan read that exchange with advance notice that it was communications regarding consultation on the case. He never should have read it. Mr. Rosie testified about an in-chambers meeting with Judge Gall, Brad Rosie, 
Andrew Baldwin, and Nick McClelland, and perhaps one other prosecutor involved in the case early on. Mr. Rosie testified that during that meeting, Judge Gall clarified that the parties could share information and brainstorm with anyone, that the intention of the gag order was only to prevent the parties from holding press conferences, setting out future press releases, and conducting interviews with the media. That testimony was uncontracted. The defense tried to call Mr. McClelland as a witness, but the court would not allow it. He had the opportunity to cross-examine Mr. Rosie regarding that conversation, but did not. The court can rely upon its own memory without being a witness, which would relate back to the defense's request for recusal. Mr. Baldwin's communications with Westerman and sharing of his Frank's memorandum with him and others for critique is exactly what was contemplated. The prosecution's allegations that Mr. Baldwin's discussion with Westerman violated the gag order is unfounded and not supported by the evidence. Additionally, Sergeant Holman and Mr. Mullins testified that they were aware that Mr. McClellan was exchanging information with Gary Boudet, the most prodigious leaker of all. The court would not allow evidence of the substance of those communications. It therefore is not known what information Mr. McClellan disclosed. It would have been relevant and probative as to whether Mr. Baldwin's discussions with Mr. West Westerman were prohibited by any rule or order or were inappropriate in any manner. If Mr. Baldwin is to be held in contempt, Mr. McClellan should face scrutiny as well. Attorneys with combined criminal defense experience of 120 years testified that they would routinely consult with both lawyers and non-lawyers about the evidence in a case during trial preparation. They all said it was crucial to trial preparation and explained why. Those lawyers testified as to sending and receiving misdirected emails. They would address those mistakes exactly how Mr. Baldwin did. They also testified, contrary to Mr. McClellan's argument that Mr. Baldwin should have reported to him and the court, that it would not cross their minds to report such events to a prosecutor or judge. Notably, there was no evidence of any obligation for Mr. Baldwin to report the accidentally misdirected email to the prosecution or judge. Furthermore, he had taken immediate corrective action and reasonably believed it had been resolved. Each of those lawyers testified it was standard practice for criminal defense attorneys and their regular practice to establish a separate area in their offices to spread out the discovery and anticipated evidence for trial preparation. They had never thought to secure the area because they never expected a betrayal like Mr. Baldwin suffered. No one expects to be betrayed. Eight additional experienced criminal defense attorneys echoed the testifying lawyers with affidavits that were not admitted. The court declined to hear testimony and admit documents of much more detailed, serious, and damaging leaks. It has been preserved in the court record. Those leaks were purposeful and willful. The defense renews its plea for the court to consider such evidence when contemplating whether Mr. Rosie or Mr. Baldwin knowingly, intelligently, or willfully committed indirect attempt beyond a reasonable doubt. The Indiana Supreme Court in State v. Schumacher that the appropriate standard in an indirect contempt proceeding is beyond a reasonable doubt. The court applied the beyond a reasonable doubt standard in Re Perello, 1979. Respectfully submitted David R. Hennessy. Appendix 1. Number 1. Blood at the base of the tree to the right. I don't have that pick, but I would assume so. Number 2. References blood at the Webbers. Number three, that EOA channel has some real potential cult victims in his comments. Number four, mentions Robert Lindsay. If want more Odin stuff, Gabe Ellis, Eric Williams, Dustin Prater, Tyler French. Number five, is that the Cro Kokomo crew or people connected to Odin suspects? Prater can be connected to Westfall. Six, 
references Crime Night. Seven, references Jeff Stankard. Eight, defense got girls' phone records. Good stuff. Nine, Ellie declined to look at video footage of business by the Mears entrance. My personal dark horse, Jerome Weiss. Ten, may have Messer's phone too. Tried to give it to Holman, but he ghosted her, so she gave it to Andy. Eleven, I just watched the Brandon Woodhouse YouTube. I assume that is you on there. Twelve, Clutch just blamed the family for it. Said Cody Patty would be taking the fall. Thirteen, Andy had audio of Professor. This is the opposite of what Sergeant Holman said. Professor said the opposite of what Holman said he said. Fourteen, judge going to set a suppression hearing, but Andy is looking for clarity. Fifteen, references the interview with Professor Turco. Sixteen, references Jennifer Scully. Seventeen, screenshots. Eighteen, I like the delusion about how much a picture of Keegan Klein is worth. Ha ha. Nineteen, pictures of ruins. Woodhouse sent that. Twenty, screenshot of Clutch's theory, then more on Clutch. Twenty-one, she and Kelsey both communicated with Shot's account. Twenty-two, former mayor working for McClellan has Odinus ties. Twenty-three, asked who is Max S. Twenty-four, ties to Garrett Cruz. Twenty-five, Child molester Marco Salinas got nudes of both, communicated with two accounts from Klein's Dropbox. 26. Rachel Yancey. Libby wanted Max. Max wanted Abby. Facebook of classmates of Libby and Abby. 27. Marco Salinas tied to Keegan Klein Dropbox. 28. Rocks at the CVS. Selena has tied Alan to see Sam, according to Russ. 29. References Snowburger getting nudes. Known scumbag. 30. References Hannah Rostel and Elliot Guy. Screenshot Keegan Klein. 31. Side-by-side -side of sketches. The defense never made such an exhibit. 32. References Joe Louie as jive. 33. Shared with one other person, you only one saw the CS. Hood up? Yes. Kelsey's BF? Yes. 34. 555. Was there around 11 to 11.30. 35. Family in Delphi, the Rainies. 36. Kelsey, Chase, and Bree lawyer up. Joins Air Force, left town. 37. Bree's account. Listen to what she says. 38. Brandon Woodhouse stuff give you more cover. 39. Banned me in JFJ because of Patch's conversation with ND Clown. 40. Driving home. Thinking supposed to go to Franklin this weekend. 41. Want Nick to stop hiding shit. 42. Want people to stop running their mouths over shit they don't know. 43. Picture of F tree. 44. Post screen, not mine. 45. Snay going to be mad at you. I'll go visit him and smarten him up. 46. Journey banned me for no reason. Banned from posting facts. 47. Reference to Barbara. 48. Picture of F tree has full picture with evidence label. 49. Want to clear up false information. 50. Abby's grandma said thanks. 51. Screenshot of screenshot printed on paper then cropped. 3. 20. 18 stuff. 52. References Woodhouse video. 53. References Chastity Gerald. 54. Message from Holman where he contacts Woodhouse. Got more coming. 55. Told no rocks about everything. Elvis Fields duped by Mike Thomas. 56. He's going to be with Andy tonight, talking about me going down Saturday. 57. You and Brandon and these guys. 
58. Another source, Kelsey. 59. References Doug Rice, Jerrica, and Anna Evans. 60. Rayleigh told Mary, picture of Duval, Drake French saw. 61. They are implying the leak of photos of the bodies. I don't know. Someone sent them to me. Not sure what Matt is implying. Did someone tell him they saw them? Did someone show someone else? I just don't know. 62. My wife just left me. 63. Mark, talk to me, please. 64. Sketches confidential. Rather not from me. Assume under gag order. Shared with one other. You are only one CS hood up. 65. Nick drunk at bar. My cousin was there. Derek. Nick said Cody Patty should be worried. 66. I know he does blow too. 67. Are you going to release it? I can't. 68. It is obvious pictures of this stuff and not originals. 69. BG was Carl Abbott. 70. A series of pictures not related to the defense.